And so we've been asking different questions about what that looks like, trying to answer those questions. So this morning, my question is this, what is the right order of worship? Now, I know you have an answer, all right? So here's what I want you to do. Introverts, um, God has favor on you this morning, okay? So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your slap guide if you picked one of these when you came up in this morning. If not, go to aldersgate.info. You can pull it up in a digital format. Just find anything, your neighbor's hand, whatever, all right? Here's what I want you to do. I'm going to give you just a couple of seconds. I want you to write down the perfect order of worship, okay? Just write down in your mind what is the perfect order of worship, Jot it down somewhere. I know that um, you're thinking I can just jot it down in my head, and I don't know about you, but that is failing me more and more, all right? So just jot it down somewhere. What is the perfect order of worship? We're going to answer that question this morning. We've been answering several different questions. Uh, The first question we answered is, what does it look like to gather together? We looked at Solomon's advice in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, that we should come prepared We should listen and we should respond or obey to whatever it is that we hear the Holy Spirit speak to us when we are gathered together in worship. Last week, we uh, asked the question, what do we do with our hands? And we talked about body posture and using our body. We are created body, soul, and spirit. And so our spirit connects with God that comes from the inside with our soul. And this body posture is an outward expression of an inward reality. This morning, what is the perfect order of? Of worship. Now, before any of you run up here and give me your answers, I'm going to tell you how we typically answer that question. Okay? I think we typically answer that question, as well as a lot of other questions that have to do with church, Christianity, uh, being Christ like, from three different perspectives. One of those perspectives is what I call the tradition perspective. We will answer the question, what is the perfect order of worship, based on our familiarity with worship, based on our faith tradition, how I grew up, or where I've been in my faith. And because of that, this is the tradition that I hold to. But it's even much greater than that. It's not so much my own faith tradition. This goes back to the beginning of the church and the traditions the church has practiced throughout the years and the traditions that we have in the church. And we keep doing those traditions when it comes to to worship. Here's the thing about tradition is sometimes we follow through on tradition and then completely totally forget why we have that tradition. And so the answer becomes, well, I, I don't know, we've just always done it that way. And we don't understand why we're doing it. Example. This morning, we're going to take Holy Communion together. Now, I'll explain more about that near the end of the message this morning. But I want you to pay attention to the communion elements that are here. There are some scattered around the room as well. And, and some of you, I grew up in a faith tradition where I'm looking at the communion elements and I'm asking myself, where's the big white sheet that covers them up? Right? Right? Like in a lot of faith traditions, we cover the communion elements until it's time to observe the Lord's Supper, communion, or Eucharist, right? Can I tell you where that comes from and why we don't necessarily have them covered here? So, back when the church started gathering in buildings, even though they were indoors, there was no central heat and air. And when you get a lot of people in a building with no central heat and air, other things like to be in there too, like flies, And so to keep the flies off of the communion elements, they would cover it with some kind of linen. Now, this is a perfect example of tradition, like something, there was a problem, the solution was a necessity, but before long, we stamp tradition on necessity, and we have to keep doing it, even though we don't know why we're doing it. So we can answer out of tradition, but we have to be careful that we understand the why behind our tradition. Why? Do we worship in this manner or this mode? Another perspective I think we can answer it from is the perspective of reason. God gave us the gift of reason. Now, I know some of you are thinking, no, not everybody got that gift. But yes, God did give us the gift of reason. He gave us a brain. He gave us intelligence. He wants us to be able to to figure things out. Now, listen, when reason comes together with the power of the Holy Spirit, that's a very powerful thing. God wants us to be able to do that. Reason is a very powerful thing. Let me give you an example of reason and Holy Spirit coming together. Uh, Any of you grow up in a faith tradition where Sunday school was the bomb? 
Like, you, you didn't go to church unless you went to Sunday school, right? Can I tell you where Sunday school came from? During the Industrial Revolution, the church invented Sunday school. And the reason the church invented Sunday school is because children were not going to school. Instead, they were working. Sunday was the only protected day, and so families would come to church on Sunday. And because kids weren't in school getting education, here's what the church decided. Hey, let's start this thing called Sunday School. Very original name, right? Let's start this thing called Sunday School, and let's teach kids how to read and write using the Bible. Isn't that a fantastic idea? Reason. Holy Spirit came down and said, boom, this is a great idea. Use your reason to do this. Now listen, we no longer live in the Industrial Revolution. But when we use reason sometimes without understanding the reason behind it, we may step into a building and go, mm, nope, nope, no Sunday school, that's not for me. Without even really realizing, I'm not, Sunday school's great. I'm just saying, sometimes we hold on to things and we don't even understand why we're, we stamped tradition on it, and so therefore we must continue to do it, Right? Let me give you another answer we usually uh, answer, or a perspective that we usually answer from, and that we will call experience. If I had an experience that was fantastic, then we should replicate that experience every chance we get it. Right? Like if I had this experience with the Holy Spirit, with, with God, with Jesus, right? Like if I, if I had this experience, and man, I just want to replicate that experience every chance I get. And you know what? I realized that your experience may not have been the same as mine, but obviously we should practice my experience, not your experience. Right? So we use tradition, reason, and experience. And listen, there's nothing wrong with all of these things. And, and God gave them all to us. And we should lean into all of them. Now, some of you are sitting out there and you're good um, Wesleyan theologians. And so you're like, I know where he's going with this. In Wesleyan theology, we call that the quadrilateral. You're like, well, you only talked about three. Yeah, yeah. Because the fourth part of the quadrilateral, the other thing we answer the question from is Scripture. God's Word. Like, tradition is great, but in order to honor tradition the best, it needs to be interpreted through the lens of Scripture. Reason is fantastic, but our reason should never contradict anything found in Scripture. Experience is incredible, but can only be fully lived and realized through the lens of Scripture. And so when we answer questions like this, any question, we realize that all these things are important, but at the top of the list is scripture. Scripture has primacy. So what does scripture say then about the right order of worship? Just a little bit. Not much. Scripture, nowhere in scripture will you open it up and it will say, okay, um, you start with the, the benedictions at the end. What's the beginning called? Invitation to worship. You won't find that anywhere. You, you won't find benediction anywhere as either. You, 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 you won't find you sing three songs and then the sermon. You, you won't find what those songs should be. You won't find that anywhere in Scripture. Why? Why did God not give us any of that in Scripture? I personally believe it's because worship is dependent on time, place, and context. Think about it. The early church, we're going to get there in just a second, they didn't have all this technology, right? But reason would stand to believe, I mean, reason would tell us, well, it would kind of be foolish to continue to worship the way they worshiped in the first century with all this technology we have available to us, right? So it, it's time, it, it's person, it's play. Here, the way we're worshiping here this morning in Lubbock, Texas at 11.21 a.m. is totally different from how they worshiped in India seven, eight, nine hours ago, depending on where you live in India. You know why? If you've been keeping up in the news, it is now illegal to worship Jesus Christ in India. They didn't do it out in the open like this, I can assure you. It's dependent on time. Let me show you where it does talk about worship in Scripture. Grab your Bible, okay? I'm ultimately going to end up in Acts chapter 2. So actually, I would just encourage you to go ahead and go to Acts chapter 2. But I'm going to show you really quickly from 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 
where we do get a little glimpse into the order of worship. Now, let me tell you a little bit about what's happening in 1 Corinthians, okay? So Paul has established the church in Corinth. And they are writing or did write a letter back to him. And they had all these questions. And he's writing in response to their questions. Now, we actually believe Paul wrote in another letter to the Corinthians. So there's 1st, 2nd, 3rd Corinthians. But that one of those letters didn't get included into the canon of Scripture. Okay, But in this letter, Paul is literally... If you read through 1st Corinthians, you can tell. There's been some questions posed. And Paul wants to give the answers to those questions. So as you look at 1st Corinthians chapter 14, you can tell that a question has been asked about prophecy, tongues, uh, how to handle those things in scripture. And so Paul gives the answer. But here's what Paul did not do. Paul did not say, here's the first thing you do. Here's the second thing you do. Here's the third thing you do. Here's how you exegete your sermon. You should have three points, a beginning, a conclusion. He didn't do any of that. Instead, here's what he said. Verse 26. I'm not going to read all of it. It's a great thing for you to go study this week. Verse 26 says, What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things, watch this, watch this, watch this. Let all things be done for building up. Okay, Skip down to the last verse, verse 40. But all things, there's that phrase, all things again. But all things should be done decently and in order. Really? This is some of the very little instruction we get about order of worship. Okay, But what I want us to do is I want us to go back to Acts chapter 2, and I want us to get a glimpse of worship from the early church. Acts chapter 2, I'm going to start reading in verse 42. Let me set this up just a little bit. So the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, same story of Jesus, just told from a little different perspective. In the Gospels, Jesus is crucified. On the third day, he raises again. He stays on earth for 40 days, makes several appearances during those 40 days. Acts chapter 1 is his last appearance that we get before he ascends up into heaven. The the Holy Spirit comes down from heaven in what we call Pentecost, which was uh, promised by Jesus. And the early church begins, listen, in the power of the Holy Spirit. And all through the rest of Acts, we get how the church moved forward through the power of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, we get some scriptures that give us a glimpse of the early church. All right? So I'm going to read uh, the English Standard Version, these, vi- the, these verses, and I want you to look as, as you're following along with me in your translation. What, what does this speak to us about worship, order of worship, whatever, Okay. So, verse 42, Acts chapter 2. And they, they is the church, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul. Last week I talked about how we're created in Trinitarian form. Body, soul, spirit. The soul is the deepest part of who we are, our heart, our will, our mind, our emotions. All came upon every soul. Now I want you to watch what was manifesting externally through body posture. Many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, let me, that was Old Testament word for church. And day by day, attending church together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being Saved. So Jesus, we just ask right now, as we've done the previous two weeks, as we've worked through this theme of worship, that you would speak to us. Through these verses and others that we're going to look at, speak to us about what it means to come together and worship together. What should that look like? I trust now, Holy Spirit, that you are going to speak through me, that you're going to speak to each of us, with the just exact words that you want us to hear. And so we're listening, and we pray for a spirit of obedience to what it is we hear. 
And we ask in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to tell you what I see in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, when it comes to the church. In fact, if I was going to say, this is the church, I would say three things that I see in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. Number one, worship. They gathered together to worship. They gathered together. It says they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. That, that they were devoted to the prayers. We get in other places in Acts and other places in the Bible where they, they sang songs together. Like they, they gathered together. You saw in those few verses that they went to church every single day. That's the right order of worship. It's a joke. <laughs> they gathered together often, and when they did, they were devoted to worship. Worshiping God. They were also devoted to community. You can't read those verses and realize that they did not have this life together thing figured out. They stuck together in fellowship. They stuck together in community. They met to love God and love one another. And they were devoted to mission, worship, community, mission. They were devoted to being on mission with God, with Christ. They followed Christ's mission. Right there in those verses, you see how on one another they would sell possessions and give to anybody who had need. You know what was happening? The people on the outside were watching that happen on the inside, and the Lord added to their number every day because the church was being the church. They were meeting together for worship, and they were loving on one another as they loved on God, and they were following Jesus' mission. You can read through the rest of the book of Acts and see how they followed the mission of Jesus. So worship, community, mission. This morning, I want us to focus in on the worship part, okay? And here's what I, I, I see in the worship part. I see that church had two main focuses. Word and sacrament. Word and sacrament. This is in your slap guide. Word and sacrament. We're told that they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, which was what? Exactly what they had heard from Jesus, the word. They were devoted to the word, and it says that they broke bread together. Now, oftentimes when people read that, they have a question. Well, does that mean that they ate together or they shared Holy Communion together? Yes, Let me remind you, when Jesus instituted the sacrament, which, by the way, the church thinks of two sacraments. The typical, most churches practice two sacraments, baptism and Holy Communion. When Jesus instituted Holy Communion, what was he doing with the disciples? He was eating a meal. Every first century Jewish meal consisted of bread and wine. And in that meal Jesus was having with his disciples, he simply took the elements that were already part of the meal, bread and wine, and instituted the sacrament of Holy Communion. And so when they would gather together in people's homes and go to the temple, they would take that what was already on the table, bread and wine. And while they were having a meal, they would remember the body and the blood. When they came together to worship, they were focused on the word the sacrament. But you can read through Acts. We don't get in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, that people were being baptized, but I'm going to talk about that here in just a second, okay? Word and sacrament. Listen, tradition is great, reason is great, experience is great, only when interpreted through the word. Word and sacrament. So, let me talk about word first. Okay? It doesn't matter what the order of worship is as long as it's focused on the word. When we come together to sing, our song should be focused on the word. I grew up in a faith tradition where we sang the old hymns. Many of them, most of them, the words came straight from the pages of scripture. Now, you don't know this with tradition, Most of them were put to the tune of a bar song. What? Yeah, you know what hymns were put to music to? Just the contemporary music of the day. 
But the words were so rich. The lyrics were so rich. Why? Because they were from the word. Today, when we sing songs, whether it's hymns or contemporary music like anybody would sing, like you would hear on the radio, it's the words, the words that come straight from Scripture. I gave you an example of that last week, how one of the songs we sang, I mean, like the word was literally right from the pages of Scripture, Ephesians chapter 2. When we preach, it should come from the Scripture. Like we shouldn't just read Scripture and then preach our own opinion. It should come right from the pages of Scripture. Sure. When we, when we say prayers, it should be from the word. When we, uh, uh, any element that we do in worship, it should be focused on the word, period. So listen, <laughs> I don't think Jesus really cares what order we do it in as long as it's focused on the word. Word and sacrament. I, I want to show this to you in the Old Testament. Okay, So if you still have your Bible open or your Bible app on your phone, I want you to go to the Old Testament, to the book of Nehemiah. Okay, Let me help you out. Find the middle of your Bible. If you're on your phone, you're on your own. But if, if you've got a Bible like this, open it to the middle, and you will probably land in Psalms or Proverbs. Maybe Job. But if you land in Psalms, Proverbs, Job, go to the left. Okay, And right before Job, you will find the book of the Bible called Nehemiah. And I'm gonna, I want you to go to Nehemiah chapter 8. And as you're going there, let me tell you what's happening here. So God's people were one nation, Israel. They had a civil war, and they divided. There was a northern kingdom that kept the name Israel, and a southern kingdom which took the name Judah. And the Israel kingdom was eventually uh, overran and conquered by a people group known as the Assyrians. And they took the people out of Israel and they took them to the territories of Assyria and, and there they were held captive and in bondage basically. And then sometime later, the southern kingdom, Judah, was also conquered. They were conquered by the Babylonians. And the Babylonians did the same thing. They took the people out of the southern kingdom, which Jerusalem was in the southern kingdom, and they took them to Babylon, and they were in bondage and held captive there. If you have any knowledge of the Old Testament, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they were from the southern kingdom. They were taken into Babylon, and there they served the Babylonian kings. Okay? God raised up two people, Ezra and Nehemiah. When it was time, it was about 70 ish years, when it was time to go back to Jerusalem, and to rebuild the temple and the wall around the city of Jerusalem. Ezra was primarily responsible for rebuilding the temple. Nehemiah was primarily responsible for rebuilding the wall. Hear this. Their mission was so much more than rebuilding Jerusalem. Their mission was rebuilding their spiritual life. And do you know how they did it? Come on, this is easy. I already gave it to you. You know how they did it? Word. They rebuilt it on the word. Let me show you. Ezra, uh, Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1. This is great. You can go read and study this this week. I'm just going to read a few verses for us this morning. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. The, 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 the wall around Jerusalem would have different gates that people could go in and out of, and they all had names. So this is the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses. Now, this would have been known as the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. That's what they had in written form at that time. That's what they held on to and what they clung to, all right? So that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all, could, all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. When God decided to rebuild the people's spiritual life, when they met together, it all focused on the word of God. Skip down to verse eight or six. 
And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, amen, amen. I, cannot, I just want you to see this. Last week we were talking about using our bodies as an expression of worship. And all the people answered, amen, amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Let me just say again, when the word of God gets a hold of you on the inside, in your soul, in your spirit, you can't happen but to respond externally to what's happening on the inside. Verse 8. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood its reading. We've done this a couple of times here at Aldersgate. We've taken Nehemiah 8, and we've done it here at Aldersgate. In 2016, we moved out of this space, and for 10 weeks, we met over at All Saints Episcopal School, which is actually where the church was planted back in 1985, while this space was being remodeled. And the Sunday before we moved back into this space... Right here in this space where communion is right now, we had a podium and a Bible. And for over 72 hours, people came in every hour on the hour. And we read from the first chapter of Genesis to the last chapter of Revelation. We read the whole word of God over this space. We did it again in 2020 after COVID. Once again, we were out of this building for 10 Sundays. And on the Sunday, we gathered back into this space Before you got here on Sunday, 72-ish hours, we read from Genesis to Revelation. Because we want everything we do to be saturated in the word. Let me tell you about one of the most powerful funeral experiences I've ever had. You're like, that's morbid. Um, Several years ago, I was asked to go to El Paso to officiate a funeral. Amy and I had some friends in the church. Her father passed away, and they were not a part of a church home in El Paso. Uh, And so they asked if I would come and officiate his service. And so we did. We went to El Paso, and we went to um, her stepmother's home, to the the widow's home, sat down in front of her. Um, Her father was a, a physician, a very prominent physician in the city of El Paso, And so um, I I sat in front of his widow, and she looked me right in the eyes, and here's what she said. You will not say anything about my husband at the funeral. You're going to read four scriptures, and I'm going to give you the scriptures that you're going to read. Now, you got to know something about me and the way I approach funeral services. Like, I... um, Anytime someone pass, I, I end up in the home. I want to meet with the family. If I don't know the person well, I want to get to know them. Like I want the funeral to be so personal for them. I, I, I want, I, even if I didn't know the person, I want people sitting out there to go, man, he knew that dude well. Like I want it to be so. I'm going to glorify God by honoring the person that we're laying to rest. And so this is very important to me. And so I was like, oh my gosh, I, I, what do I, I can't do that. What am I going to do? Four scriptures? I don't even get to choose the scripture. I don't even like that scripture, right? Like, what am I going to do with this? I stood up in a chapel at a funeral home in El Paso, Texas. No obituary, no words about the deceased. I read four scriptures. To this day, it's probably one of the most powerful sermons I've ever preached at a funeral. And I learned a valuable lesson that day. The word of God stands by itself. I had more people come up to me at the end of that funeral service, prominent physicians in town, who were probably much like this man, Christian, non-Christian, I don't really know, definitely unchurched, Weeping through the power of Scripture, the Word of God. That's the centrality, that is the focus of our coming together and worshiping together. And I'm just going to say this this morning if we're doing anything else, why? Why? Now we can do it lots of different ways, but the focus is the Word of God. I love tradition, I don't like change. I love reason. Ask Amy. I will argue anything all day long. I love experience. But those things are only helpful when interpreted through the word of God. 
that stands on its own. Word, sacrament. All right, I told you, we don't see in Acts chapter 2 anyway. We do in other places in Acts. We don't see in Acts chapter 2 those 42 through 47 verses of water baptism. But here's what we know about water baptism in the New Testament. Every person, as far as we know in the New Testament, every person who called on the name of Jesus was water baptized. Except for the thief on the cross. It just kind of wasn't possible. As far as we know, every other person. Acts chapter 47, 2, 47 says... The Lord added to their number every day. And so because of what we know in the rest of the book of Acts, every person that was added to their number was water baptized. Jesus was water baptized. As an example for us, a model for us, you can read about it in Matthew chapter 3, Mark chapter 1, Luke chapter 3, John chapter 1. And then Jesus said, go and do the same. Go and make disciples of all peoples, baptizing them. That's, that's, that's a word for water baptism. You know what you do see in Acts chapter 2? A baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm just making the point that it was word and sacrament. The church honors two sacraments, most faith traditions, baptism and Holy Communion. I'm going to move to Holy Communion, but let me just say this really quickly before I move off of water baptism. Uh, we had a baptism in the, <laughs> we didn't just put this here for looks today. Um, we had a water baptism in the 930 service, and there's still water in it. And if you feel the Holy Spirit nudging you to take the step of water baptism, all you have to do is let us know. Go to aldersgate.info, next steps, water baptism. If you do that, we'll connect with you. We have baptism journals that you work through. There's some for kids, some for students, adults. We will work through these with you. We will disciple you. We will help you take that step, okay? But I'm going to say this this morning. If you feel strongly that the Holy Spirit is nudging you to do that today, I'll be done here at the end of the service. You come find me. We'll do that before we leave this morning, okay? All right, second thing, communion, holy communion. We're going to take Holy Communion here together as a, a, a body of believers. I'm going to give you some instructions because here's what I'm going to do this morning. Because I believe the word of God stands on its own, I'm not going to interpret anything from the scriptures about Holy Communion. I'm just going to read to you what the scriptures say about Holy Communion. And then we're going to take Holy Communion together. So here's what I want to do before I do that. I'm going to give you the instructions so that we don't have to miss the moment when we get to that place, okay? Here's the first thing you need to hear. At Aldersgate, we believe Holy Communion, Lord's Supper, Eucharist, however you refer to it based on your faith tradition, we believe it is available to everyone. You don't have to be a part of this church. You don't have to be a part of any church. You can be in, in one of the worst places in your life that you've ever been, but if you want to seek Jesus, you're welcome to the table. You'll have a couple of different ways to do that this morning. When we get ready to take communion, there'll be two people standing here and two people standing over here, and they'll have a loaf of bread and a cup of juice. When you come forward, you'll be given a piece of bread. You'll take that piece of bread. You'll dip it in the juice, and then you'll take and eat. The altar rails are open. You can stay here if you want to. You can return to your seat. Around the worship center, we have five tables and at each of those tables, there's a plate with some crackers on it, big crackers. You can just come, pinch off a piece of the cracker. There's a cup of juice on the table, and you can take that piece of cracker, and you can dip it in the juice and then take and eat. Also at those tables are a basket full of individual served gluten-free communion. It's a bread and juice. If you prefer that method, you can just go to those tables, grab one of those, take it, eat it, drink it, and then hold on to the cup. And when the service is over, you can drop the cup in the trash on your way out. There's going to be plenty of time and space. You don't have to rush. You don't have to crowd. At those tables, I would love to see husbands and wives serving one another. I would love to see families serving one another. I would love to see small groups and friends 
serving one another. I, I would love to see strangers serve one another. Because that's what we just read in Acts chapter 2 this morning. They met together, shared a meal, and took communion. Now, I'm going to ask you to take everything out of your lap and put it away. I'm going to come down on the floor in front of the communion table, and I'm going to read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 the instructions that Paul gives about communion. There must have been a question about Holy Communion in the church. And so Paul answers the question and he gives the instructions. I'm gonna read out of the message translation and I want you to go to Nehemiah chapter eight and I just want you to have the word read over you. And then I want you to be able to respond the way the Holy Spirit is asking you to respond. Posture in worship is important, so I'm asking you just put yourself in a place of posture where you can receive the word of God that stands on its own. Let me go over with you again exactly what goes on in the Lord's Supper and why it is so centrally important. I received my instructions from the Master himself and passed them on to you. The Master, Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, took bread. Having given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he did the same thing with the cup. This cup is my blood, my new covenant with you. Each time you drink this cup, remember me. What you must solemnly realize is that every time you eat this bread and every time you drink this cup, you reenact in your words and actions the death of the master. You will be drawn back to this meal again and again until the master returns. You must never let familiarity breed contempt anyone who eats the bread or drinks the cup of the master irreverently is like part of the crowd that jeered and spit on him at his death is that the kind of remembrance you want to be part of examine your motives test your heart come to this meal in holy awe. God, we ask you to create in us a clean heart and a sense of holy awe. We sit in your presence. respond as you lead to worship you in the name of the
Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. While you continue to listen, I'm going to ask those four that are going to come and serve to go ahead and come and do that.